Good morning, Collective. How are we doing today? Yeah, okay, good to see you. Um, I uh, want to tell you something before I even kind of get into my introduction on my notes is um, what is happening here? Michael can't say this because it sounded like he was bragging, um, but I'm going to brag on you, is what is happening here is so rare. Um, there are thousands and thousands of churches that are started brand new in our country every single year. I'm connected with a whole bunch of them, and almost never do you see what's happening at Collective happen at a church that's just not even two years old yet. Um, I just want to say, show of hands real quick, how many of you have been part of one of Collective's local impact things in any way, shape, or form? Okay, good number of you. Um, how many of you have gotten baptized at Collective? Let me see those hands. Good number of you. How many of you ended up at Collective, not because God gave you some vision and you woke up and, and Googled the word Collective, but because a friend brought you to Collective? Yeah. What is happening here um, isn't usual in churches because it's catching on and it's creating a movement. And here's um, what you're going to see in years to come. Is we just celebrate our 10th anniversary as a church at Mosaic, where I'm from. And what we did at that uh, is we had the people who've been there since year one stand up. And, you know, they were scattered throughout the auditorium, right? But what happened was I told them to look around because anyone who's had a marriage that's made it or anyone who's gotten baptized at our church, anyone who's experienced the thrill of going on a global trip, anyone who's gotten debt-free and on and on and on is because of those early people who took the risk. And one day you're going to be in your own facility. One day you're going to have more people, but you are the ones who will be able to say, well, we were here from the beginning, so you're welcome. And um, so I just want to say keep it up because what's happening here is not normal. And a big reason it's happening um, is because of your lead pastor. And I meet a lot of great pastors, and a lot of them have wisdom, and a lot of them have drive, and a lot of them have good gifting, but it's really rare to find a pastor who has all three of those. And your pastor loves you. And he lays awake at night thinking about how to serve you better. And he talks to me all the time about things he's wrestling through, of how to lead you better. Um, but you are blessed with a godly, loving pastor who has a great marriage and loves his kids and loves you so much. We just give it up for him right now before we even jump in? I want to... I want to kind of start by asking you um, a series of questions, and, and it's a game that you may have played before. If you're kind of demented, you've played it. It's the game called Would You Rather. And yeah, okay, so some of you are familiar with this, and the Would You Rather game kind of works like this if you're unfamiliar. You pose a question to somebody, would you rather do A or B, but the rule is you have to pick one. Like you can't say both of those are gross because it has to be gross. You can't say I'm not choosing one. Like that just means you choose both. So you have to pick one. So you can, um, well, we'll just have you turn the person next to you and answer a couple of these right now. Would you rather, we'll start easy, live without AC or internet? So go ahead and just turn the person next to you. AC or internet, would you live without? Okay. So yes, the correct answer is AC. You can't live without the internet. Okay. Here's another one. Would you rather eat a plate of boogers or lick a toilet seat? And for the sake of fun, we'll say the toilet seat is in a public gas station. Okay, go ahead and answer. Okay, okay next question. Next question. I love how y'all have to give, like, explanations. It's like, well, it's boogers, but here's why. Okay, just don't. Would you rather live in a nudist colony or live with the Amish? No, 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 no. See, so you say, now, wait a second, wait a second. Before you answer, look at the people in your row, okay? Just saying. Okay, last one. Last one. So, uh, would you rather need to milk yourself or lay eggs? No, answer right now. Just turn the person next to you. Would you rather need to milk yourself? Some of you are like, I'm just looking straight ahead, buddy. I don't care who you're telling me to talk to. So I got one more for you. Aren't you ready for lunch now, right? Um, I got one more for you. And it's a question that if you post to young people, if you post to anybody in, who's millennial or Gen Z, which is basically those born 1980 or after, if you go to them with a the would you rather question that says, would you rather make an impact with your life or they'll cut you off and say, make an impact with my life. 
Because I kind of do research of different generations because if a church just kind of grows older with the lead pastor, it's just going to not exist one day, right? So we as churches always have to be reaching younger people. So I've really studied what do younger people want out of life. And the number one thing they want is to make an impact. Which is in contrast to previous generations, maybe like our parents' generations, um, their number one impact was security defined as making enough money. But the next generations came up and said, well, money didn't really solve all your problems, and then you had other problems, so I just want to make an impact with my life. Here's our problem, is we don't know how. In fact, I read 40% of Gen Z wants to change the world by inventing something, (laughs) which is like, well, what are you going to invent, right? And so we're left with questions, like do I start a nonprofit or fundraise or volunteer, because we don't know where to start. I did like this sign, you can put it up. They said everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change the toilet paper roll. I mean, that struggle is real, y'all. That's a problem, for those of you who don't know. Um, And there are debates, by the way, if I can just go on a tangent, of if the toilet paper goes over (laughs) or under, right? So I just wanted to clear this up for you today. There is a right answer. This is the original patent for the toilet paper roll. I want you to notice it goes over, not under. So some of you put the toilet paper all over, and some of you just hate humanity, but now <laughs> you know. But we have challenges, right? When we want to change the world, what problem do I attack? I can't attack them all, so what do I choose? What's most important? What thing's most accessible for me? We think, how do I find time? Because I've got school and family, I've got a job, I'm dating, I've got kids, I'm in night school, I'm a single parent, I'm starting my career. How in the world can I change the world with my schedule and my lifestyle? We say, what's the first step? Do I raise money? Do I raise raise awareness? And maybe most important is what I'm doing actually making a difference. Like, does it just sound good but not really help people? Is what I'm doing helping? How can I know? How can I be sure? And Christians, those of us who are believers, carry an extra weight on all this because we have this command from Jesus to share his good news with the world. So we're told to serve the helpless, evangelize the world, disciple other Christians, love our neighbor. How in the world do we do that? It's overwhelming. Fortunately, Jesus is here to help us. And what you see in Jesus is somebody who makes life very simple. Not always easy, but very simple. And I think sometimes we think Jesus makes life complex, like he came to make life harder, give you more rules, tell you what not to do. But the real Jesus makes life more simple. I think part of the reason we're confused on Jesus sometimes, we have a wrong picture of Jesus. And maybe you got a wrong picture from the way you grew up or the tradition you were raised in or how your parents did or didn't follow Jesus, or maybe even some movie you saw. Um, Sometimes it's because of like literal pictures of Jesus we saw. For example, I just wanna show you a few. Um, There's creepy Jesus, right? He's glowing, he likes to eat cupcakes that look like hearts, that's just weird. Um, Some of you have seen hipster Jesus. He turns water into craft beer. There's ninja Jesus who shows up in times of trouble and saves the day with machine guns and ninja stars. Some of you like animal lover Jesus, who's always like petting kittens and lambs. Um, This is a guy, I just call this one boyfriend Jesus. Because this is the guy you want to take home to mom, right? Like, mom, here's who asked me to prom. He's sweet and tender and cuddly. But my favorite of all of them, show it, buff Jesus. (laughs) A lot of us have a wrong picture of Jesus, so we get these wrong pictures of what he wants us to do. But what has happened for a lot of us in this church is we've realized the picture I had of Jesus from growing up or that experience isn't real. And what's happened here for you is you've met the real Jesus. And you found the real Jesus wants to take my life, my broken, sinful, rejected God, selfish, lazy, don't wanna deal with my shame, painful life, and he says, I'll give you something better. And it's not just forgiveness of sins in heaven when you die. He even says, I'll give you a better way to live right now. And in this series, Jesus is ruining the game for us, meaning he's saying, hey, here's what you thought it was about. I'm going to change the way you think about it. And when it comes to us making an impact with our life, fake Jesus says, if you want to have an impact, you need to sell everything, go around the world to some place that's poor and dirty and you don't want to live and tell people about Jesus in really uncomfortable ways. You ever been told that? But here's what real Jesus says. He says, I'll give you something that fits in your normal life, It doesn't take much money, it doesn't take much planning, but if you do it, you will change people's lives forever. See, over the past, I don't know, six months in my daily Bible reading, I kept coming across this 
particular word and this particular concept that just kept coming up in Scripture over and over and over again. And I finally, it got through to me, and I realized this is kind of a big deal to God for people who say they follow him. And I've got to warn you, when I tell it to you, you're going to be underwhelmed. You're going to think, that's it? And you're going to want to write it off. And here's why. Because sometimes we want the thing that feels good as opposed to the thing that really accomplishes something. I'll explain what I mean. About a year ago, my wife and I went on vacation. And my wife's ideal vacation is take me somewhere hot where I can sit on my butt and do nothing but get a tan and have waiters bring me cold drinks with little umbrellas in them. So that's what we did. We went to Florida. Waiter comes up and says, can I get you something to drink? She orders some icy cold drink with a little umbrella. They bring it up to her. But then she kind of nudges me. She goes, what's this? And I look at it in horror because I'd heard of such things, but I'd never seen one before. I said, babe, that is a paper straw. And paper straws don't work in icy cold drinks. Because icy cold drinks, you can't drink them fast. You'll get a brain freeze. You know this. So you have to kind of sip on them over the course of an hour or whatever. And that paper straw will not last in an hour in an icy drink. It was just mushed by the end of it. What is wrong with our world? I'll tell you. About a year ago, two years ago, this viral video happened showing, some of you have seen this, right? Showing a turtle getting pulled out of the nose, uh, showing a turtle, sh showing a turtle with a straw getting pulled out of its nose, and it shocked the world and said, we got to get rid of plastic straws. But here's what I found out when you actually research it. Plastic straws don't cause ocean pollution. In fact, the, the United States in general does not cause ocean pollution. 95% of the world's ocean pollution comes from 10 specific rivers. Eight of them are in China. Two of them are on the continent of Africa. And anytime we have less waste is good, but 46% of the plastic in oceans is actually discarded fishing nets. So if we could find a way to not have fishermen discard their old nets or lose them, we would actually be making a huge impact in ocean pollution. And fortunately, people are working on that. I'm a little nervous right now because y'all are kind of judging me. I'm thinking y'all are going to get out your titanium straws and attack me after church. But the reality, here's my point, is sometimes a viral video or good ad campaign can make us feel like we're making a difference when we're really not. And on the flip side, sometimes the things that don't sound like they're making that much of a difference at all can turn the world upside down. And that's what Jesus is going to teach us today. We're going to find a simple and easy way from Jesus to change the world. Today's scripture is Matthew chapter 10, and the context of it is Jesus is talking to his 12 apostles, like his inner crew, and he's saying, I'm sending you out to tell people what I'm doing. And he's giving them a series of instructions, and here's what he includes. He says, anyone who receives you 12 receives me. Anyone who receives me receives the Father who sent me. If you receive a prophet... As one who speaks for God, you'll be given the same reward as a prophet. And if you receive righteous people because of their righteousness, you'll be given a reward like theirs. And if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. Now here's what Jesus is teaching today. It does not sound sexy. It does not sound overly spiritual. But it is how you change the world. Hospitality. That's it. And he makes a couple of interesting points about it. First, hospitality is somebody we show everybody. Look at the scripture. We'll just scroll through it real quick. He says you show hospitality to apostles. You show it to someone who acts like a prophet. You show it to righteous people. He says you show it to the least of my followers. He wants us showing hospitality to everybody. He also says showing hospitality is as good as doing what they're doing. He says, verse 41, you'll get the same reward as a prophet. You'll be given a reward like theirs. What he's saying is if you see people who impact thousands by being on stage in front of them or leading a concert that leads people to Jesus or selling a million albums or writing a best-selling book that tells people about me and helps, me, helps them encounter me, he says, if you just show hospitality to people, you're making as big an impact as they are. And that sounds crazy, but the big deal to, to Jesus is hospitality. Now, be honest, that was a little anticlimactic, right? That's not what you were expecting. About a month ago, I was talking about this concept of hospitality with a woman I'm friends with, 
And uh, she messaged me later when she was thinking about it, and she said, you know what it's like? She said, it's like when you spend eight years of your life falling in love with someone as they escape their abuser, free slaves, obliterate tyrants, come to the aid of the world by helping to defeat death, all while single-mindedly pursuing what was stolen from her and her family. It adds up to eight years of you crying, cheering, stressing, hoping against hope when all seemed lost, only to have her lose her mind in the end, be murdered by her nephew lover, have her drag and destroy her throne in a fit of grief, and have the guy who's contributed nothing at all rule over her kingdom, and realize in your own fit of grief that none of it mattered and you just wasted 72 hours and 34 minutes of your life watching a show that does not care about you or your feelings and is stupid and pointless. (laughs) Yes. So let's define hospitality very simply. Hospitality is having people over to eat and drink. That's it. I like how the sun like changes the mood in here, right? We got some clouds so it feels real serious, like God really wants you to get this point right now. I am convinced though that having, having people over to eat and drink is maybe the most overlooked spiritual discipline, growth potential, and evangelism opportunity we have. If you are taking notes by writing down or taking pictures, please take a picture of this because this is the main point of today. There are lots of spiritual disciplines out there. Read your Bible, pray, serve others, give money away. But it is quite possible the spiritual growth area we neglect the most considering how much it's talked about in scripture is just having people over to eat and drink. I'll show you. Hebrews 13, 2. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. Peter says, carefully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. Paul says, always be eager to practice hospitality, Romans 12, 13. I want to show you a couple more verses about hospitality, and let me set these up because these actually talk about what an overseer of the church should be. Some translations call it an elder. And that basically is a person who's designated to be guardrails for the church by praying for it and making sure it stays on scripture. Now, collective, we don't have overseers just yet because it starts how every new church does. We have a management team of outside people, but one day we will slowly, and we're already in process, add people from inside the church to that team, and eventually they will become official overseers to hold this church accountable to the the scriptures, have it stay on mission, and hold Michael accountable as he leads it. So that's an intense role in the church. Now, if you are making a list of the things an overseer should be who has to guard and protect the church, what would you say? I think the first things on my list would be faithful to a spouse, a good husband, uh, generous with money maybe, uh, you know, knows theology well. I don't know. That's what I'd come up with. But here's what Paul says when he's writing to Titus. He says, Titus 1.8, rather an overseer, again, some translations call it elder, must enjoy having guests in his home. Like the number one thing that he wants, the place where it starts is just showing hospitality. And this wasn't like a one-time thing for Paul because when he writes a letter to Timothy about the same office of overseer, like big role in the church, here's what he says. An overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. So some of those that I would think of off the top of my mind, right, like not violent is a good thing, you don't want a leader in your church getting in a fight in the church parking lot. I'm just going to go on limb and say that's probably not what you want. But how many of us would say, yeah, and right up with that, as obvious of that, is they have to be somebody who practices hospitality. If you want to look for a leader in the church, Paul says, ask who's having people in their home to eat and drink, and you'll find them. And this defined the life of the early church, Acts chapter 2. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and to sharing in meals and to prayer. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. A catalyst for growth in the early church. Numerical growth, relational growth, all of it was simply having meals together. And that's it. Over and over in scripture, the message is clear. If you have received mercy from God, the way you express that to other people is by having them into your home to eat and drink. Hospitality is a spiritual discipline. Hospitality is a sign of a mature believer. Hospitality, as one writer put it, is the easiest way to change the world. One author said this way, the secret weapon for gospel advancement is hospitality. And you can practice it whether you live in a house, an apartment, a dorm, or a high rise. And I hope this is a relief for some of you. Because some of us, right, are on the edge of following Jesus. Like, I'm not sure I want in because I think it's just going to be just a bunch of rules of what I got to do and not do. 
And I hope this is a relief because what Jesus says is, hey, just practice hospitality because Jesus makes God practical. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're saying, wait a second, Carl. Are you saying the best way I can love God, the best way I can love other people may just be to have them over for a meal or drink? No, I'm not saying that. Jesus is saying that. But I know you're still maybe having your objections in your head, so I just want to call them out. Maybe you're thinking, but that's not sexy. <laughs> you're right. It's not. But ordinary does not equal insignificant. And what we're talking about is an expression of the gospel. Jesus brought you into his family, brought you into his home. You did not accept it. You did not deserve it. But he said, I will make a way so you can be a child of God. That's why he died on the cross. That's why he offers you forgiveness of sin. That's why he says, repent and be baptized. It's why every week in this room you'll hear, if you want to give your life to Jesus, check the baptism box in your connection card, and we'll follow up with you and have a conversation. Then once you have Jesus, Paul says, Romans 15, accept each other just as Christ accepted you. So when you practice hospitality, you're showing, you're living out a tangible expression of the gospel, the fact that God accepted you, no questions asked. And think of how we spread the gospel. Author Dust, Dustin Willis wrote this. He said, like, unlike throughout human history, we do not suffer from a plague in which thousands of people are, are dying. And if there were, we have hospitals to send them to. There likely won't be a family from another region traveling through your neighborhood tonight looking for a place to stay. We have hotels for that. There aren't people in our country being hunted down by an oppressive government whom we can hide in our basements. He says, although some immediate needs that Christian hospitality was able to meet throughout history may have changed in some ways, we must not assume the need for Christian hospitality has vanished. That is a great lie, which has kept us from using our homes as weapons in the spiritual war raging against us. The people around us may not be dying of a physical plague, but they certainly suffer from a spiritual one. They may not need a place to sleep tonight, but they certainly need somewhere they can belong. So practice hospitality. We may object, but I don't have time. I get it. You don't have time to add something to your plate. That's true for most of us. The great thing about having people over to eat and drink is you're going to do that anyway. You're going to eat dinner tonight. You're going to have a drink to relax this week. You have to eat. You're going to watch your favorite game or your favorite show. Have you heard this phrase, show whole? You heard this? Urban Dictionary defines it like this. It says, when you finally finish binge watching all the episodes of your favorite TV series from Netflix, Hulu, or Amazon, and as the credits to the final episode roll, that empty feeling that wraps around your soul because you don't know now what to do with your life like a good friend just left you forever. Example, I think I cried three different times during the finale, and now I have a show hole where my heart used to be. But if you think of it through the lens of hospitality, here's what you think. Is how can, don't nudge the person next to you or stare at them guiltily. Just let God convict them, okay? It's okay. If you think through the lens of hospitality, you think, well, how can I have somebody watch that show with me? How can I have somebody watch the game with me? How can I integrate relationships into what I'm already going to do anyway? Why, by the way, a lot of us think, I hear this line all the time, a lot of us think, well, it's just a crazy season. I can't do this, just a crazy season. I can't do that, just a crazy season. Listen, I am old enough to now recognize, you know what's after this crazy season? Another crazy season. And you know what's after that crazy season? Another crazy season. And it's just going to be a string of endless crazy seasons, so you might as well just try it during a crazy season. Somebody said, but, or somebody thought, but people don't do this. Many people don't get together. They retreat to their homes. That's why most of us don't know our neighbors. We get in, we get out, we go on with our lives. And you're right. The data says one in three Americans have never interacted with a single neighbor they have. Whereas 40 years ago, one in three Americans spent two evenings per week hanging out with their neighbors in each other's homes. I read of one guy who started to practice this. And just, this is like old-fashioned question came out because he had people at his house all the time. And one of his neighbors he hadn't yet met just approached him one time and said, what are you doing? Are you all playing bridge in there or something? He's like, no. <laughs> Somebody may object, but my house is a wreck. <laughs> well, if it's a disaster, maybe time to clean it up. But this just goes into the DNA of who we are at Collective, right? Because at, at Collective, the benefit is I don't have to clean up my life first before I let you know who I am. And when I have you in my house, I'm not there, you're not there for me to impress you and my kids to act perfectly. You're just going to see the mess in all its glory. So just go with it. Somebody may say, but how do I use this for Jesus? 
Well, what you don't do is force an awkward spiritual conversation and say, do you know Jesus? Do you want to talk about Jesus? Do you want to pray? Do you want to accept him right now? Do you want to sing worship songs? I have a guitar we can talk about. It. I can quote some scripture. What do you want to talk about? You don't do that. Jesus says, love your neighbor, not annoy your neighbor. What you do is if you're having for a meal, you pray before your meal anyway, just pray for them. I think it was last Monday, Tuesday, maybe, we had some neighbors over. They don't follow Jesus, but we just do what we always do. We pray before the meal. So when we thank God for the food, I just said, God, thanks for this couple, and I pray their marriage will continue to go well, and they will serve each other like Jesus served us, because I know if that happens, they'll have a healthy marriage. And God, help this new job thing that's coming up, and I pray that you give them wisdom and help them um, serve people well. Amen. And we went on with our night, but plant a seed for them. We had a single person over. Pray something similar. Say, God, thanks for this person. Thanks um, for their school or their job, whichever season they're in. I pray that you bring them a spouse that will treat them like Jesus treats me because if they have that, man, they're going to love marriage as much as I do. It's just going to be fantastic. Helps have fun tonight. Thanks for this food. Amen. It's not being weird, but it's just letting them know where we stand, right? Some people object and say, but I'm going through a hard time then you need other people. And there's probably not a better way for you to be around other people than to say, you just wanna come over, no agenda, just bring some food, that's it. Some people object and say, but this costs money. Well, it can cost a little, I guess, but keep it simple, don't get fancy. One person I read about just texts, Friends on Friday afternoon and says, hey, whatever you're going to cook at your house, bring it over to my house. Let's eat together tonight. Just keeps it really simple. I read about one guy who got a raise at work, and he decided for that calendar year, 100% of his raise, he just set aside in his budget and labeled it hospitality. And he used what he got for his raise, because he already knew he had enough to live on, used his raise to have people over to eat and drink for the next year. And listen, we could go on all day with objections, but here's my point. How much healthier would the church be if we just share meals together all the time? How much more would we laugh together? How much more would we be in tune with each other's stories? How much more would we be able to pray for what's really going on in each other's lives if we just had each other over? And what you'll find is if you do this, you will, one person at a time, change the world. My favorite story about this is from a woman named Rosaria Butterfield. She wrote um, her story in a book called Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. And here is how she described her impressions of Christians before she became one. She said, the word Jesus stuck in my throat like an elephant tusk. No matter how hard I choked, I couldn't hack it out. Those who professed the name Jesus commanded my pity and wrath. As a university professor, I tired of students who seemed to believe that knowing Jesus meant knowing little else. Christians in particular were bad readers, and they were always seizing opportunities to insert a Bible verse into a conversation to end the conversation rather than deepen it. Stupid, pointless, menacing. That's what I thought of Christians and their God Jesus, who seemed weak. Well, she began researching several years ago this organization that used to exist called the Religious Right, um, and their treatment of the homosexual community of which she was a part. So she thought, I better dig into their source material and started reading the Bible so she could argue better against them. As part of her research, in 1997, she wrote an article in their local newspaper just bashing uh, this uh, old men's Christian conference. And to her surprise, amongst all the mail she got afterwards, she received a letter um, that was nice, that was kind, from someone who described himself as a local pastor named Ken. She said, with the letter, Ken initiated two years of bringing the church to me, a heathen. Oh, I'd seen my share of Bible verses on placards at gay pride marches. That Christians who mocked me on gay pride day were happy that I and everyone I loved were going to hell was clear as blue sky. But that's not what Ken did. He didn't mock, he engaged. So when his letter invited me to get together for dinner, I accepted. My motives were straightforward. This will be good for my research. Something else happened, though. Ken and his wife, Floyd, and I became friends. They entered my world. They met my friends. We did book exchanges. We talked openly about sexuality and politics. 
They did not act as if such conversations were polluting them. They did not treat me like a blank slate. When we ate together, Ken prayed in a way I'd never heard before. His prayers were intimate, vulnerable. He repented of his sin in front of me. He thanked God for all things. Ken's God was holy and firm, yet full of mercy. And because Ken and Floyd did not invite me to church, I knew it was safe to be friends. I continued reading the Bible, all the while fighting the idea that it was inspired, but the Bible got to be bigger inside me than I. It overflowed into my world. I fought against it with all my might. Then, one Sunday morning, I rose from the bed of my lesbian lover and an hour later sat in a pew at church. Then one ordinary day I came to Jesus open-handed and naked. In this war of worldviews, Ken was there. Floyd was there. The church that had been praying for me for years was there. Jesus triumphed. I was a broken mess. Conversion was a train wreck. I didn't want to lose everything that I loved. But the voice of God sang a sanguine love song in the rubble of my world. I weakly believed that if Jesus could conquer death, he could make right my world. Through her book, that story has reached tens if not hundreds of thousands of people. But it all began with a very simple question. Want to come over for dinner? God wants to use you to change the world. And it may be you invent something. It may mean you start a nonprofit. It may mean you produce a best-selling album or write a best-selling book, but it will definitely include you saying to someone, want to come over for dinner? So I got a homework assignment for you. We don't leave what happens here in here. We'll give some homework, and you got to complete it by the end of July. I think some of you will probably complete it July 4th this week. In the course of the next month, I challenge you to invite at least one person into your home from outside collective, which for some of you means you may need to get connected. And I challenge you to invite one person into your home from collective, which for some of you means you may need to get connected. And that's it. Because if you do that, Paul says, you'll be acting like the most spiritually mature people there are. Jesus says, I'm going to give you a huge reward. And scripture throughout says, you're going to be changing the world. Collective, you run well. God is doing amazing things here. And if we live out this simple, easy way to follow Jesus, we haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg of what he started. Let's pray. Jesus, I'm so thankful um, that you don't just give me forgiveness in heaven, but that you help me with my life today, here, right now. And I'm so thankful that you make God simple. So God, I pray for this church that over the course of the next month, we'll do this. That whether we live in a dorm, apartment, house, or high rise, We'll say to one person from inside this church, you want to come over? We'll say to one person from outside this church, you want to come over? And it may not feel like much, but thank you that through that simple act that all of us can do that we'll be changing the world. We love you. Amen.